So now we will open our first session for day two, surveillance and contact tracing, privacy, computing, and data infrastructure. A special thanks to Changqing Cheng and Dominique Duncan for serving as co-moderators, since we probably won't have time for discussion, so they will help summarize the session. Our first presenter is Nigel. Well, thank you for this opportunity. Um, I think it's good. We've all seen that we were slow to respond to this one, and maybe by having such consortium and communities together, we can be faster to respond to the next pandemic. So my, my group, we focus on sensors, and when the pandemic hit, of course, we thought, how can we help in this regard? And so this is the grant we got. This is the team. So with motivation. So what really hit was in March 2020 when there was this big issue of shortage of PPE as well as time to get tested. So you had to go to these central testing locations and that required the person administering the test to assume you were sick. So they had to always gear up. And so all of that material was used that could have been in, in a hospital setting. Um, and then there's the bigger issue of, of having to get to a site. So I'm here in Iowa where there are a few larger clusters of bigger cities, but for rural communities to come in, it was a big hassle. Um, and so this gave us the idea of what if, what if there was a card that you could send out that could be used to measure and then could be conveniently mailed back such that we could still do tracing and a kind of a population map of, of who is sick. And the idea is to keep it all within the card. So not having to take a sample at home, put it in, and then have to open it up and test in a central lab, but instead have it react and be done on this card and be able to measure it through that envelope. So the picture on the bottom is a stack of essentially what it is. It's a resonance sensor, so it has a radio frequency. And when a piece of viral RNA is present, it will kick off this chain reaction, this kind of Rube Goldberg device, that it unfolds a toggled switch, which creates a protease. That protease degrades a casein or gelatin coating. And that coating then causes this resonant frequency to shift. And then all you have to do is take that card and scan it through a reader to figure out if it's the starting frequency or the shifted frequency. So the good thing is it worked. Some of the bad things is there's still some things that have to be done off chip. So this idea of having to collect the sample and lyse the virus and amplify that RNA just a small bit is still needed. And so, you know, our team is still thinking about how that could be part of the card as well. It's non-trivial. But the exciting thing is it worked at a very low copy number. We tested different variants, and I don't know why the label got cut off, but those red ones are different coronaviruses, and the gray one is uh, SARS-CoV-1, and then the two blue ones are two strains. So that was the, the Washington strain and the Hong Kong strain that we had at that time. The other thing that we're trying to also solve is this card works great if you overnight ship it and scan it the next day. But what we also found is there's a little bit of drift. If that card sits for a long period of time, the signal doesn't get as high quality. So of course, like in all things, there's a lot more engineering that could make it more robust. But the idea of having a low cost card that can be mailed out, simply used at home and then sent back uh, does work. And the remaining challenges, like I said, is that RNA amplification which then begs the question, if you have to amplify it anyway, there's some direct readouts. So maybe in some use cases, this isn't the best way. Time to result can be decreased. We just let it incubate overnight and that works fine if you're just sending in the next day. As we did this project, some of the need areas were having to hunt down samples was quite a, a challenge. So, you know, next time this comes around, it'd be nice to say, here's a central repository, you've received this funding and here's where you need to go to get your standards to test. That way we're all testing the same standards. And then of course, whenever you make a diagnostic or a tool, there's a question of regulatory bodies, which we, or at least myself as an academic have no idea about. And so it would be nice to have uh, learning sessions or just you know office hours, right, with these bodies, such that as new technologies come online, um, there's already a method to talk about how to take it to the next step. That's it. That's high level. Paper's in submission phase. So when it comes out, please read. Hello, everyone. Um, here today we are discussing about a sensor again for SARS-CoV-2. And uh, we are essentially using 2D materials based sensors. And what we are you know, using is a graphene and graphene oxides that has ability to bind to oligonucleotides 
and this binding is happening because of the pi pi interaction in hydrogen bonds and so what we are doing is we are building a microfluidic device which is integrated with a sensor that can detect uh, sars cov2 here the single stranded dna is used as a ligand and which binds to the graphene surface and it lifts off the surface when there is a target viral rna present in the sample and that's the basic working principle of this sensor and we are kind of optimize the process how we can bind more number of ligand to the surface and then can selectively lift off the uh, ligands and read the changes happening as a signal on and signal off. So what basically we get is uh, like this green line on the top right corner where this is kind of a graph we get for a negative control sample and the red one is for positive sample. And we basically using this flex material inkjet printed sensors for going forward as a method for testing other RNA viruses also. And uh, we are very excited and that uh, it really works and uh, it kind of may help us building a at-home device because the only sample preparations we need is uh, heating the sample at 60 degrees centigrade. So we are also building another system so that we can integrate the whole system and it can be done at least at point of care, if not at home. We have also tested the sensors for its selectivity against other coronaviruses like SARS-CoV and MERS-CoV, and we see it's very selective. And also the sensitivity of this assay is currently as 10 to the power 5 copies per ml. So we are aiming for the future, enhancing the sensitivity of these sensors using gold nanoparticle doping on the graphene or other 2D materials like MXene, titanium MXene. And then we are further trying to enhance the sensitivity of these sensors. And other challenges that remain is like not only increasing the sensitivity, but also can any other 2D materials may help in enhancing the sensitivity and building a better sensor. We are also in the process of doing a clinical sample analysis of using this same platform. And we definitely appreciate if there is any sample bank and that we can kind of get regular samples from, especially for testing. And in, that's one of the, I think, suggestions we might have for the NSF, if they can help us establish those kind of uh, sample resources. That's all I have. Uh, thanks, everyone. And thanks, NSF, for finding this project. <laughs> we are really excited that it worked out well. Thank you. Hello, everybody. My name is Michael Klosko, and I work in Dr. James McGrath's lab at the University of Rochester. Today, I'll be talking about our work supported by an NSF rapid grant, which culminated in an accepted paper with the title of Rapid and Specific Detection of Intact Viral Particles Using Functionalized Microslit Silicon Membranes as a Fouling Based Sensor. The overall vision for this project was to create a new type of point of failure diagnostic uh, to help supply the overwhelming demand for rapid SARS-CoV-2 diagnostics. We aim to develop a point of care virus sensor that did two things. First, we wanted it to function without the need for external instrumentation to maximize its accessibility. And second, we wanted it to be able to differentiate between intact virus and viral components to avoid the false positives that PCR assays produced in individuals who were previously infected, but no longer infectious. The sensor we envision is shown as a hydraulic resistance diagram on the left. The top portion represents a negative test result, where a sample is injected in the port on the left and takes the upper path, which contains a porous ultra-thin silicon nanomembrane. This is the path of least resistance until virus is introduced into the membrane. The bottom portion of the diagram represents a positive test result, where virus capture follows the membrane and increases its resistance so that the bottom path becomes the new path of least resistance. In this manner, we are able to determine if a test is negative or positive for virus depending on where fluid protrudes from the device. With this design in mind, we were able to successfully produce a diagnostic which functioned as described by adapting one of our existing microfluidic platforms and by pre-mixing purified vaccinia virus, which we used because it was a bit easier to get our hands on than SARS-CoV-2, but uh, we mixed that vaccine virus with stripped avenue conjugated antibody and coated our one micron slit pore silicon membranes with biotin. 
we call the resulting test, the microfluidic device featuring a silicon membrane for diagnostics or micro SIM DX for short. This test fulfills the previously mentioned criteria and uses size and affinity-based specificity to provide 100% specificity and 97% sensitivity within a dynamic range that spans over four orders of magnitude roughly from 10 raised to the 6 to 10 raised to the 10 virions per milliliter. As shown on the left are how the microsim DX responds to the lack of vaccinia virus, producing a negative test result shown by the protrusion of fluid in its center in the top portion of this figure, and uh, how it responds to the presence of virus, producing a positive test result after the membrane is clogged, shown by the protrusion of fluid at its end in the bottom portion of this figure. Overall, we have had great collaboration amongst different departments and universities in Rochester, allowing for the uh, successful development of this device. Unfortunately, uh, we were unable to develop the test quick enough to have an impact on this pandemic, but the device exhibits modularity that could provide useful for future pandemics or other applications. Our remaining challenges include working with SARS-CoV-2 itself, uh, working with biofluid matrices, adding an injection flow rate variability control, and adding a more binary test result indicator. So uh, as a result, we are actively looking for collaborators that could provide us with uh, surrogates for SARS-CoV-2 that would be safer to use than the virus itself. Thank you very much. Okay, hi, this is Perena Guma, and I'm the PI for this Eager grant, which has the exploratory component in that we develop a breath test for COVID-19, a non-molecular test, and that was a truly the disciplinary effort because it involved material science, electrical engineering, veterinary medicine, infectious disease expertise, and we had also a clinical collaborator, Dr. Matthew X. Line. You see the device that we made to the left, the small black box, the portable device is the breath, the breath analyzer. And here you see a physician demonstrating how the breath test has been used. Uh, uh, someone exhales for 10 seconds and within 15 seconds, they have an answer whether they have COVID-19 or not. And like I said, the work is based on identifying gases, biomarkers in breath that shows the response of the body to the infection. It was very, very specific to COVID-19. And we have just out the publication of the clinical data as well as publication of the sensing information. What you see here is that this breath test, at the heart of it is a single catalytically active resistive sensor that qualifies for very, very rapid response. And this is highly selective to nitric oxide. And we were able to find with a single sensor, do the rapid analysis of uh, the diagnosis of the SARS-CoV-2 infection. And we have a unique breath print associated with the disease. And that is due to the temporal uh, change of the gas uh, distribution over the sensor. It has the small letter omega shape, as you see in figure A. And that's a very distinct breath print. And that's a very disruptive approach, a game changer for infectious disease diagnosis, but also for detecting other diseases based on gases exhaled from the breath. The technology we have developed is extremely different from artificial olfactory systems. And like I said, we've done clinical tests to validate it, both in subjects in the ICU uh, that had COVID-19, as well as other uh, respiratory diseases, pneumonias, and, and so forth, and done also clinical studies on the population at large. In the next slide, I would like to summarize that uh, we had a very successful multidisciplinary collaboration, and that was actually the reason that we had a successful result. Uh, the progress was outstanding, and we were able to validate not only develop and validate not only the sensors, but also the devices, the prototypes, and the testing protocols. And uh, we have also submitted an application for regulatory approval. Uh, an EUA is pending with the FDA, so we have to learn this. I had to learn this route as well uh, from, as an engineer. There is a broad scope for collaboration, so I look forward to working with people who develop biomarkers, uh, determine biomarkers in breath or skin, and for clinical testing of large populations of humans and animals. We've done also animal testing in this project public health policy guidelines for breath and skin testing for non-invasive diagnostics. And I'm really grateful to the NSF because it has been proactive. My program managers, previous and current, they have led the pathway to success. 
by funding fundamental research on materials and sensors and devices that are meant to protect public health and safety. And I think focusing also on the manufacturing of these novel technologies is going to enable us to translate the results of the research very, very fast to the marketplace and educating regulatory agencies on the potential of these novel technologies is something to look for. And with this, I thank you so much for your attention. Good afternoon to all. My name is Sachin Xian from University of Florida. Our project is a multidisciplinary collaboration from engineering, medicine, and biology. Our project goes back to when COVID first hit us in 2020. We had a very limited resource constraint on testing resources at that time, taking Alachua County as an example. So we had a almost 270 thousand population and only uh, 1,500 tests are available every day. And most of these tests actually go to the hospital for patients with symptoms. So for mass testing, the resource is actually uh, even more limited. So uh, for mass testing of COVID-19, it is really critical for us to develop an effective sampling strategy to direct these limited testing resources to the group of person at the highest risk of the most imperative demand. This is important for both viral testing and antibody testing because for viral testing, we want to identify more positive patients to slow the uh, infection. And for antibody testing, it helps us for the antibody surveillance and plasma treatment. Uh, we also want to identify more people with COVID uh, antibody. So this is the algorithm that we develop. So we use the past and the current testing results as a baseline, and we incorporate a lot of information on the blood group level. We first incorporated the mobility connectedness because mobility pattern is related to how people are exposed in different blood groups. And then we further incorporate mobility and social vulnerability as they are related to how serious the consequence of infection would be. We incorporate this information to propose a monitoring and sampling measure to show how important that we test a block group. And the algorithm will eventually give us whether we sample a block group and how many tests to assign to them. So this is our result. We actually worked with uh, our sponsors, the Florida uh, Department of Health. So we analyzed their viral testing information and tested our proposed method. So the top figure actually shows how effective our sampling strategy would be. Uh, we can see that the adaptive method, which is our proposed method, can identify more and more positive patients over time while the baseline method with random sampling is basically a constant number. And we show that by incorporating monitoring strategies with our sampling strategy in the table below, we can show that our method can quickly identify positive patients and also identify the outbreak of the pandemic uh, very fast. And we also worked with a local blood center, which is called Life South, because they have community testing capability. We worked with using their uh, antibody testing, like blood mobiles, and we analyzed their data and uh, provide feedback for them to direct where their blood mobiles should go in a time sequence. This is pretty much the idea of our project. Hi, everyone. Thank you for the opportunity to introduce our project, REACT. This is a collaborative effort between Emory, USC, and UT Health. I'm Li Shong, the PI at Emory, and Cyrus Shahabi from USC is also here with us. So our project is trying to develop techniques to support real-time contact tracing and risk monitoring via privacy-enhanced mobile tracking. In our original design, users can submit their locations to the server by a contact tracing app, to enhance privacy, users can control the precision or privacy level with which their location will be collected and used. Then we realize these data do not have to be specifically from a contact tracing app, so we can use the location data that are already collected by many other existing apps. And given the location data, React will not only enable contact tracing, which identifies the contacts, but also enables estimation of exposure risks for individuals in real time based on the locations they visit, and also the fine-grained risk estimation for spatial regions. 
Our primary viewpoint is that in contrast to many contact tracing apps that are relying on Bluetooth-based proximity tracking, which is only useful for contact tracing, we believe that location-based tracking, assuming we have sufficient privacy enhancement, will enable risk estimation that go beyond contact tracing, both for individuals and for the community. So, so far, our efforts have focused mainly on the privacy enhancement techniques that support contact tracing and risk estimation, as well as the risk estimation methods. For privacy enhancement, we develop location perturbation techniques based on geo-indistinguishability, a location privacy notion that extends differential privacy for some of you who may not be familiar with. The illustration shows the samples of perturbed locations using a truth location that satisfies geo-indistinguishability. And you can see a higher privacy level on the right-hand side corresponds to a higher level of perturbation. Of course, given these perturbed locations, the challenge is how to accurately determine if two users are actually in contact. Our main finding is that given probabilistic modeling, it is still feasible to identify the contacts with reasonable precision and recall. And we also study customizable privacy policies to enable more flexible privacy utility trade-off and techniques for ensuring differential privacy of aggregated location or mobility data to support community or location-based risk estimation, as well as alternative searchable encryption techniques that have a stronger privacy guarantee, but slightly more efficiency cost. And on the risk estimation front, we develop models for estimating fine-grained risks that are associated with the particular region and time using real-world mobility data as shown in this map. This is mainly Cyrus's team's work. And in addition, since the mobility data which we acquire from the company only represents a subsample of the entire population, we also developed subsampling techniques for better estimating the spread in the population. So please check out our papers if you're interested in more details. We did hit some roadblocks. We did not end up deploying the contact tracing app as we originally planned due to the institutional review delays and ultimately the limited adoption we expect to have. However, we do believe that the location-based risk modeling does not have to depend on explicit contact tracing apps. The location data that are already collected by many apps should be utilized for pandemic research, of course, given sufficient privacy protections. The other challenge we had is the lack of fine-grained ground truth case data that can be aligned with the mobility data because public case statistics are mainly at the aggregate county level. So we ended up using simulated case data in our studies, but we are trying to explore more fine-grained truth, ground truth data for better evaluations. And there are many open research challenges in using the mobility data for the pandemic research. The first one is privacy. In addition to the privacy techniques that we and many others are developing, there are broader challenges in terms of understanding the privacy implications, how to communicate the privacy guarantees to the stakeholders and so on. And for risk modeling, the challenge and also opportunity is how to incorporate behaviors, for example, mask wearing, vaccine adoption into the risk modeling and how to design policies and intervention and prevention, for example, policies such as shut down certain businesses for reducing mobility to not only minimize the risks, but also consider the social economical impacts. So many of these questions require interdisciplinary research and community stakeholder engagement as highlighted by Amira and many other speakers. So we are very thankful to NSF programs and initiatives that are specifically encouraging these, including the PREPARE virtual organization and this particular PI meeting. We also received funding from the Smart and Connected Community Program to continue to pursue some of these questions. And we're also planning for an uh, interdisciplinary center on spatial temporal intelligence in collaboration with GMU, as many of the people are here today. We definitely hope NSF continues to foster the interdisciplinary research and encourage these efforts. Uh, that's all. Thank you. Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to talk about our work. My name is uh, Sharad Sharma. I'm a professor in computer science and director of virtuality lab at Bowie State University. Our goal of this project is visualization, analysis, and prediction of COVID-19 is to find out reasons as to why Black community is disproportionately impacted during coronavirus pandemic. So this project is a collaboration between UDC, University of District of Columbia, and Bowie State University. I have one of my past doctoral students who is working at UDC, so we combined together to submit this proposal. The focus of this at Bowie State University is the development and visualization of interaction tool to analyze COVID-19 patients' data set in an immersive, non-immersive, and mobile environment and evaluate those tools in accordance with user requirements, which can enhance situational awareness. 
So the goal of our work is to basically combine neural network predictions with human-centric situational awareness and data analytics to provide accurate, timely, and scientific strategy for data visualization. So COVID-19 real-time data is huge. The data is rapidly growing and numbers are changing exponentially. Our proposed data visualization tool provides situational awareness of COVID-19 data by incorporating real-time API to help in analyzing the data changes that help in predictive analysis. So you can see from the slide over here, there are three images on the left-hand side. The top one is the immersive environment, then non-immersive environment, and a mobile environment. There are YouTube videos that the links are there on the right-hand side. So we have used virtual reality device Oculus to achieve better data visualization results. So this tool aims to discover patterns in COVID-19 cases, analyze it, and display it to the user. So testing has been done with real-time feed of COVID-19 data set for immersive environment, non-immersive, as well as mobile environment. So the tool automatically loads up COVID-19 data from the tracking API, which I've given a link uh, on the right-hand side below the figure. So decision-making kind of relies on data, which comes in overwhelming velocity and volume that one cannot comprehend it without some layer of abstraction. So this human-centric situational awareness and visualization is needed for analyzing big data in an efficient way. One of the challenges is to create an algorithm to analyze the given data without any help from other data analyzing tools. So real-time data visualization can enhance decision-making and empower teams with human-centric situational awareness insights. So we have demonstrated the data visualization COVID-19 data for 50 states in US. Our proposed visualization tool includes both conceptual and data-driven information. The visualization tools includes the data from the cloud database from the API and is populated over the US map as stacked bar graphs and offering situational awareness of the COVID-19 pandemic. So the controllers of Oculus are used to create an hand input that helps the user to immerse themselves as a player and manipulate the data inside the environment. This research has shown, number one, virtual reality can be used as a data visualization platform. Number two, a more immersive environment with Oculus integration allows human-centric situational awareness and visualization that is needed for analyzing big data in an efficient way. And number three, Big data visualization can be represented in two folds, focusing both on visualization as well as interaction. Things that have gone well because of COVID-19, we have been working from having online meetings, which has surprisingly gone very well. There's a project website, a link is there, which includes all the videos over there, as well as a link to APK file. The project has resulted in five peer-reviewed conference papers, which are published, as well as there have been four graduate student presentations at the graduate workshop. And the results from this project have been incorporated into similar projects, such as crime data visualization for Baltimore, where instead of looking at 50 states, we are looking at different counties, and then uh, looking at crime statistics instead of COVID statistics. Things that have been remaining challenges, probably say, because of the evaluation of the immersive piece, we had to interact with the participants, and that was a challenge, but we still got some 10 volunteer participants for the user study. The need for collaboration, of course, in human-centered computing, human behavior, and data visualization, we plan to take it to the next level, and hopefully we can uh, submit a bigger proposal down the line. Suggestions for NSF, I would say probably facilitate the progression of these rapids who have obtained fruitful results to a next level. Thank you very much for your kind attention. My name is Rupali Bhatta, and I'm presenting on behalf of our team at Harvard Center for Geographic Analysis. Our research is COVID-19's impact on excess deaths of various causes in the U.S. We analyzed 11 CDC causes of death to determine the changes the pandemic caused on diseases other than COVID. We know that COVID is deadly, but we wanted to quantify just how deadly it is. Our objective is to let data rather than the media present a holistic picture of COVID's impact on mortality in the U.S. Coming into this project, we asked five hypothesis questions based on current perceptions in the media, Three of our hypotheses were supported, one was partially supported, and one was not supported. Our first hypothesis was supported by our analysis. COVID deaths counts have indeed not been overestimated, and the pandemic did lead to more deaths overall, among other diseases. Our second hypothesis was also supported. In early months of the pandemic, especially in hard-hit states like New York, a shortage in COVID testing kits meant that people who died of both COVID and another cause of death were logged under the secondary cause of death leading to a spike in those fatality counts. 
the third hypothesis was supported. COVID did cause immense pressure on the healthcare system across the country. And in states with spikes with COVID cases, they were mirroring spikes and other causes of death due to the strain on medical research. The fourth hypothesis was partially supported. Respiratory diseases did decrease, possibly due to COVID prevention policies like mask wearing, but influenza, which was expected to also decrease, did not. Our fifth hypothesis was not supported. Deaths of critically ill people who also had COVID were not overwhelmingly classified as COVID deaths, since other pathologies did display a spike. Now we're going to move on to how we determine those results. The CDC generally released data of 11 causes of death from 1999 to 2019 by state, year, and month as well as a preliminary data set for 2020 that includes COVID. Our main objective was to calculate what each cause of death should have been per month in each state in 2020 and compare it with what it actually was. Our first hurdle was dealing with suppressed data. The CDC suppresses counts of death for any cause when the count is below 10 for privacy protection reasons. About 7% of our data set was suppressed, mostly in states with small populations. Our solution was to average the monthly counts by cause and redistribute the surplus, adding back those suppressed values. To predict the 2020 mortality values from the past 20 years of data, we used the exponential triple smoothing algorithm, which accounted for seasonality in the data set. We determined anomalies as data with more than 10% variation and determined increases or decreases as mortality values that fell above or below a 95% confidence interval. We had four significant findings. First, there was an overall increase in deaths other than COVID. That was one of our hypotheses. Second, there was a sharp increase in diseases of the heart, diabetes, and Alzheimer's during the first wave. And you can see it by the first graph on the top right, that there was a general spike in deaths during the spring months. The specific reasons for the spikes differ between the diseases, but two general reasons are insufficient COVID testing and the stressed healthcare system. Third, the only cause that decreased was chronic lower respiratory disease deaths, which includes asthma. Some reasons are social distancing measures and mask wearing, and alternatively, deaths being counted as COVID rather than respiratory disease. Fourth, there was no increase in influenza deaths. Influenza and pneumonia, as shown by the dashboard results at the bottom right, exhibit a short season of increase in the spring and remain at predicted levels for the rest of the year, contrary to much media portrayed decrease. The increase in the spring is likely related to insufficient testing of COVID-19. So for our roadmap, something that did go well was team collaboration. Our team comes from three different countries and collaboration did go very well. The dashboard also went well. We were able to explore different causes of deaths across the country by state. What could have gone better was limitations of our preliminary data, including the suppressed values that we talked about, as well as some states that were under reporting like Wisconsin and West Virginia. In terms of remaining challenges and what we want to explore next, we would like to go into further exploration of race and gender, as well as more spatial granularity within counties or within specific states. For needs that we would like to collaborate more, if you are a medical worker with insight on epidemiology and causes of death, we would love to work with you. And suggestions for the NSF, a lot of our team are high schoolers. I'm a high schooler myself, so training young scholars is definitely something that we would like to put an emphasis on and perhaps more opportunities and funding for to allow for high school and collegiate real world research. Thank you. Hi, I'm uh, the PI for the RAPID project, democratizing genome sequence analysis for COVID-19 using Cloud Lab. My team includes Dr. Deepthi Rao, Peter Tonelato, Wesley Warren, and Eduardo Simoes. I'm also uh, you know, supervising two PhD students to work on this project. Since the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic, there has been a lot of interest in conducting large-scale genome-wide association studies to understand the susceptibility and severity of COVID-19 in different individuals. So genome analysis of COVID-19 patients can provide us an improved understanding of COVID-19. So in this regard, our vision was to democratize genome sequence analysis using Cloud Lab, which is an NSF-funded experimental test bed. So our goal is to provide the required open source tools that will allow anyone to use Cloud Lab, which is a free infrastructure, to conduct large-scale genome analysis. The reason being human genomes are very large in size, could be tens of gigabytes in size, and require significant compute and storage resources, and would cost a lot of money if you end up going to a commercial cloud provider. So there are three things that we achieved. So first is you can find, we have a GitHub site where anyone can go and sign up with Cloud Lab and they can do human genome sequence analysis once they get the credentials. The second outcome is that we developed 
a new approach called AVA that can speed up the variant calling pipelines. So our key idea is to use asynchronous computations and combining you know, task parallelism with data parallelism during the execution of the variant calling pipeline on large number of sequences. So we were able to achieve 3x speed up on 98 human genome sequences. In fact, we published our paper recently, and it was also nominated for Best Short Paper Award. We also have a data set that has been released of the variant analysis that has been done on COVID-19 patient sequences that is available from the COVID-19 data portal. So we hope others will use this data resource to advance research in COVID-19. So what are the remaining challenges that we are looking at? One is to study how we can do large-scale genome processing in a multi-site setup where we have data centers located, for example, in Clemson and Wisconsin, and we want to understand how the underlying networking infrastructure impacts genome sequence analysis in terms of performance. We also want to build a knowledge graph of the genomic variants that we have published of about 800 COVID-19 patient sequences, and we would like to make this resource available so that others can gain insights from it and advance science. We are looking for bioinformatics users to use our system. Here's a GitHub link that you can try. Our suggestions, first of all, thanks a lot to all the agencies that funded so many COVID-19 projects, but I can always say, please fund more projects. Thank you for your attention. Good afternoon. My name is Yongxiang Lu from Purdue University. The one sentence summary for our project is we use computer vision to count the number of people and the vehicles on different dates by analyzing images and video captured in many different countries. So this project actually started in 2013 when our, my research team discovered there are thousands of network cameras providing real-time data on the internet. You can see Times Square in New York right now without going to New York. You can see the uh, Duomont Cathedral in Milan without going to Italy. Uh, this slide shows the number of cameras my research team has discovered over the years, and the image here is actually captured in Czech Republic. I will post some papers about our project so you can read more details. In March 2020, when many countries started issuing restrictions to slow down the spread of COVID-19, my research team wanted to use this technology to see do people actually follow the guidelines by the government. So there are many reasons we want to do this. If you use network cameras to observe people, first, this process is fully automated. We do not need anybody to do anything because the data is already captured automatically. We do not need people to travel and record. Uh, we do all the research online. And this method can also observe activities over a long period of time. We actually capture the data every day for almost a year since March last year. This project can save data for later analysis and is totally non-intrusive. We are not disturbing anybody in any way. And this slide summarizes what we have observed. So let me explain what this figure is about. The horizontal axis is the number of vehicles we counted over time on different dates. The vertical axis is the number of people we counted over on different dates. And the different colors represent different policies. The red dots are the most restrictive. Some countries have a multiple colors because they reopen gradually. Some countries reopen all at once. Let's look at the upper right corner. It's from Czech Republic. They actually have uh, four stages of reopening. If you look at the red dots, they are mostly on the lower left corner. That means during the lockdown period, there were very few people on the street or driving in vehicles. As the countries open up, you see that the green dots are more on the upper right corner, means there are more vehicles on the road and more people show up in these places. So we can see pretty strong correlation between the policies and the number of people and the vehicles we observe. So that shows that this is a tool can, can suggest people actually follow the lockdown policy pretty well. So a common question about this research is privacy. Uh, we only use data on the internet already, and it's all in public places. On the positive side, we find very strong correlation between observed people and the vehicle. On the negative side, 
we cannot find enough cameras in places where there are major outbreaks. Uh, the major challenge of this research is the scale. Uh, we are taking in so much data and analyzing that takes very long time. Uh, we'll be more than happy to share the data if you are interested in analyzing the data. We really appreciate NSF support. And if we can get some guidance how to interact with experts in public health or policy, that would be great because I am not quite sure how to talk to them and who to talk to. Thank you. Today, I'm going to discuss some of the recent fluid mechanics results coming out from my lab on respiratory transmissions. And I'm going to discuss about three topics that we are working on. The first one is on the mechanics of infection onset. The second one is on drug delivery. And the third one is on filtration. We got funded from the rapid mechanism for the third project where I got the award with uh, Sangwan Jiang from Cornell University and Leonardo Chamorro from EYUC. So the first topic is on uh, the infection onset. I'm going to pose two very specific questions. What are the bad droplet sizes or aerosol sizes that are responsible for triggering the infection? And the second question is, what is the infectious dose? As in, what is the minimum number of variants that can launch the infection in, a, in an individual? To address those questions, let's look at what we know. We know that the infection would start at the upper airway. And we also know that the nasal lining in the upper airway, it contains uh, the ciliated epithelial cells, which has the ACE2. And the virus would bind to that surface receptor to intrude into the cells. Now, the anterior part of the nasal cavity has a relatively thick layer of mucus, which provides some protection against viral invasion. So it has been conjectured that the nasopharynx, which is marked in red on the visuals on the top left, is the first dominant infection site. It is where the two sides of the airway converge and it forms the upper part of the pharynx. So to address the first question, I decided to figure out the droplets and aerosols that would land directly over this initial infection zone, the nasopharynx, during the process of inhalation. To get that data, I have simulated on CFD the breathing conditions for a wide range of inhalation rates from 15 to 85 liters per minute. And against that ambient airflow field, I have tracked droplet sizes that are from 0.1 to 30 microns. I did not go any bigger because uh, beyond that size scale, the droplets which are being expelled by the infected host and are now about to be inhaled back by the exposed subject would undergo prompt gravitational sedimentation and would not enter the airway of the second individual. And these droplets, again, are environmentally dehydrated after being expelled by the host. I see that over this size range, the sizes from 2 to 20 microns is where the nasopharyngeal delivery peaks. So that is what we refer to as the most hazardous droplet or aerosol size range for infection trigger, which answers the first question. Coming to the second question, what is the infectious dose? We do need to know what is the viral concentration in this respiratory droplet? For that, I started to read the papers that were coming out last year and also this year. So this study on the right of your screen, this study is from PNAS last year. There they report that the probability that a 10 micron undehydrated uh, droplet would carry at least one virion is 0.37%. So I decided to develop a simple mathematical model that can um, test these numbers. And I used data on the viral loading in oral fluids that have been published. And the numbers matched up in terms of what is the probability to find one variant. So using this prediction on uh, the viral concentration and the CFD numbers on what are the bad droplets, we can quantify the infectious dose to be on the order of hundreds, which is one order of magnitude smaller than the flu virus, which shows how contagious this disease is. Touch this to other projects very briefly. So this is for nasal drug delivery. We see that if you can just reorient the nasal spray bottle, we do get almost hundredfold improvement in drug deposition at this initial infection site, which is the nasopharynx. So for this project, I have collaborations with a number of pharmaceutic industry partners. And this is a new concept of bio-inspired filtration. We are essentially trying to capture the complex nasal design in high olfactory animals uh, like dogs and pigs. They can capture particles more efficiently from the inhaled air, which helps their sense of smell. So we are developing these filters that have that kind of tortuosity from the animal nasal conduits, and they can capture the particles which are more pathogenic at a lower pressure drop, implying we would need to spend less energy to pass the air through, through such filters. And this can help us in other applications as well. We got the project for uh, mask design, but we can also design baffles that could be fitted into the ventilation ducts of confined spaces like inside a car. All these are ongoing topics. There are many other areas that we need to uh, address open questions on. For example, I would just give a sample in the nasal transport problem. The mucus mechanics is still an unsolved question, and we are working on that. 
and that would give us a better understanding of what the infectious dose, for example, could be like. And in general, these are all interdisciplinary challenges and I'm open to new collaborations. Thank you.